Welcome to our fourth video in analyzing NIH style grant applications, analyzing the approach section. And in this video, we're going to focus on the approach section using one of the funded examples. And again, we're following the current 12 page NIH format. We're just going to focus in this video on the parish application, and that's available from the NIAID website. You can also find a PDF of that research plan at the CLIMB website. Note, especially in this video, to take full advantage of what we're going to talk about, you should have read the parish research plan before viewing. We're going to dive into the science in a detailed way, so it's helpful to have at least a big picture view of what Parrish is trying to accomplish in his research plan. Now remember the NIH enhanced peer review criteria where we charted the key concepts associated with those criteria. The first was significance and we focused in on whether the research addresses an important problem or critical barrier and will it lead to the achieved aims lead to improvement in knowledge technical capability or clinical practice and will we see change in a variety of factors concepts methods technologies treatments or interventions and of course significance was very important you really had to um, pinpoint in your research application the critical barrier or important problems and both applications that we reviewed did that then we focused on the innovation section and this was somewhat less important for both of these applications but they both hit on the novelty and the innovation of what they were trying to accomplish typically through uses of um, unique ways of applying methodologies to their research problems and finally we have the approach criteria here so in this video we're going to focus on the approach criteria And really the most important parts of the approach criteria are the first two columns. Are the strategy and methodology analysis appropriate to accomplish the aims? And does the application present potential problems and alternative strategies and success benchmarks? In both these cases, both examples and truly in the parish application as well, the project is not in early stages and it does not involve clinical research. Those are specific to types of research um, applications, research funding applications. But those first two columns are really critical. Now, let's step back again and recall the big structure of the parish application. R remember that it was about the structural and binding properties of the feline and canine parvoviral capsid. And if you recall, in his significance discussion, he was very general about the importance and the critical barriers and the improvement to scientific knowledge. And it was all about understanding fundamental, fundamental aspects of this, these biological processes and structures. Because the more you understand the nature of how viruses bind to cells, the more you'll be able to understand and help vault the critical barriers of antivinyl therapy and vaccination success. And the improvement in knowledge was fundamental about the fundamental viral mechanisms and understanding deeper um, knowledge about virus structures and functions. And recall that his innovation uh, focused on specific methods that are combined in novel ways. And that was a very short discussion. The meat of his application, however, was in his approach section. And if you recall, in his aims, each section was very precisely structured. And this is where he did most of his literature review. In a very sophisticated way, he integrated his literature review into his discussion of aims. Now, let's start mapping Parrish's approach section to the criteria that we've pinpointed. First, let's work backwards and focus on the most obvious, right? This application addresses directly and explicitly problems and alternatives. Does the application present those problems and alternative strategies? And note that he does. In every concluding section of his aims, he addresses these criteria explicitly. Now, what about success benchmarks? Well, again, he addresses those explicitly 
in his concluding sections. However, he does, throughout the application, talk about what outcomes he wants from specific experiments as he dives into the scientific detail associated with this application. We're going to take a look at one of those in a second. So now we get to the heart of the application, the logic of the science, which is at the core of whether or the proposal meets the criteria that the reviewers want to see. And that's this. Are the strategy and methodology and analyses appropriate to accomplish the aims? So first, let's look at the aims themselves and their sub-hypotheses, because those aims taken together constitute an overall strategy. First, aim one, define the structural variation in parvovirus capsids and determine the effects on capsid functions and DNA release. Recall the, one of the major points, the overarching rationale behind this whole application is to really look at how these parvovirus capsids of these viruses bind to cells. And in this aim, he wants to seek further the define further the structural variation of that capsid. And he gets into incredible detail about the nature of the structure of the capsid itself and how that structure is going to affect how the capsid binds and whether it can release its DNA into the cell and cause infection. And there's a tremendous amount of detail about the nature of that structural variation. Next, he moves from structural variation to structural interactions. In other words, he's moving from structure to process. So how do the various parvovirus capsides look at that he's looking at interact with a specific receptor, this transferrin receptor? The main sort of underlying thesis here is that the parvovirus capsid will bind to that transferrin receptor. That's what it needs to bind to in order to affect the cell. So the specific binding of capsids of the feline and canine transferrin receptor is required for su successful cell infection. And those interactions are controlled by the viral structure's variant structure, structure and flexibility. So that's the key thing he wants to look at. So aim one is about the structural variation. Aim two is about the structural interactions. And then in aim three, he goes one step further. So he wants to look at how the antibodies that probe that capsid structure, that attach to that capsid structure, will determine how the binding to overlapping sites on individual cells leads to the neutralization of that transferrin receptor. Because if it binds to the transferrin receptor, it will only get infected. If it doesn't, it won't. So he wants to look at how those antibodies can be used to detect the variant structures in the capsid and that the specific position and orientation of binding controls, that is, where they uh, exist on the cell, affects the likelihood of what he calls competition with TFR. That is, if the antibodies can bind to sites on the parvovirus capsid, then it will neutralize the possibility of binding to TFR on the cell and thereby um, limiting the, the possibility of infection, the neutralization of infection. So now we see the overall strategic structure of what he's trying to accomplish. Define structural variation, define structural interactions, that process, and then go one step further and use antibodies to basically intervene in that process activity. Now let's look closely at one part of one aim to see how the methodology and analyses components are presented. And so recall aim three. Here, Paris is going to use antibodies to probe the capsid structure and determine how binding to overlapping sites 
leads to neutralization of infection in some cases, but not others. And he's got a working subhypothesis that antibodies can be used to detect variant structures in the viral capsid and that the specific position and orientation of the binding controls the likelihood of competition with TFR and neutralization of infection. In other words, the antibodies will attach to the parvovirus capsid in, s in such a way that will mitigate the possibility of TFR binding occurring. And of course, TFR binding has to occur, in their view, in order for infection to occur. So let's dive into the details here, specifically the C3B section of his approach, antibody and TFR binding, uneven fab binding, and examining for unoccupied sites. Basically what he's trying to do here is to show that applying the fab antibody, even if you put a lot of fab antibodies into the environment, there are still sites on the capsid available for receptor binding. And he talks about the structural f components that will allow that, these cleaved V2 surface loops. Right? They are unlikely to allow antibody attachment, but those may still allow or perhaps even favor the transfer and receptor binding. So such a mechanism would explain why, he writes, that fabs bind at oblique angles could sterically block that transfer and access to an adjoining cleaved site on the capsid. So he's going to look specifically at this antibody, this one antibody among the other antibodies he's going to look at. And again, that connects back to the AIM-3. He's going to use antibodies to probe the capsid structure. So in this first part, he talks about the logic associated with his experimental approach. And in this paragraph, he talks about how he's going to test his model. And he goes into a lot of detail about the specific experimental techniques he's going to use in order to do this, how he's going to pick certain kinds of capsid, how he's going to purify them, how he's going to wash them, um, how he's going to compare them to controls. And then that final sentence here, a prediction of our hypothesis is that most fabs would allow some TFR binding, but that binding would be blocked by the highly neutralizing fabs of antibodies ENF. And that is that fab would still um, block the binding to TFR um, with the specific antibody components ENF, antibody variations ENF that is. Meeting the approach criteria is the toughest writing job you will have in your proposals. And why is that? Because the quality of the science precedes the writing. However, if your science is good, if your science is quality, if your science is logical, then the writing task can be helped by looking at these approach criteria and making sure as you write you address each of them in turn. The strategy, the methodology, and your analyses, and do you present potential problems, alternative strategies, and success benchmarks. If your science is good and you follow these criteria, making sure that you address them as you write, your proposal is likely to be much more compelling.